Hi, and welcome to another episode of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. Scottish crime author Ian Rankin is among the UK's most revered and best-selling crime authors of all time. Courtesy of his now legendary series starring Inspector John Rebus, it garnered him the CWA Gold Dagger for Fiction, several Edgar Awards, the ITV Crime Thriller Award for Author of the Year, and countless others over the past four decades. He joins us today for a rare interview, and we couldn't be happier to have him on the show. Mr. Rankin, thank you so much again for taking out time to be with us. For viewers just now discovering Inspector John Rebus, you first met this one-in-a-million character while you were still back in college, correct? Well, you know, I had been writing stuff since high school, mostly poems and song lyrics for bands that didn't exist. And eventually I started writing short stories, and the first two short stories I wrote um, were successful in competitions. And so I thought, well, this is what I meant to be as a prose writer. And I was at um, university, I was doing a PhD, a doctorate on the Scottish novel, and I got an idea for a book that featured a detective. I didn't read crime fiction. I mean, most people who end up writing mystery novels or thrillers have been fans of the genre as readers, and I really wasn't. Um, I started reading mystery fiction after I'd written the first Rebus novel, and he was only meant to be around for that one book. I thought I was writing a dark, gothic novel about contemporary Edinburgh, um, that just happened to have a detective in it. Um, so yeah, he just, he came out of nowhere. He came out of nowhere and that's always a good place. Uh, I like it when stories suddenly appear and demand to be written. That's the best kind of inspiration for sure. And talk about art imitating life. Did you actually really set Rebus to live across the street from you, from the apartment you actually wrote the book in while still a student in college? Yeah, I was a, a student and I was sharing a, an apartment, a ground floor apartment with two other students. And I had what would be the living room, the living room area. So it looked out onto the main street, Arden Street. Um, and I looked across, I was I had a little typewriter, an electric typewriter that I used. And uh, it was in the bay window of the room. And I was just looking across and thought, well, this is where the guy lives. He lives two stories up across from here. Um, and that was in 1984, 85, and he continues to live in that street, although I have long moved away. Did his name jump right off the tongue, or did you have to play around with possibilities for a while before settling on John Rebus? Well, you know, I was at, I was at college. I was, I was interested in postmodernism and uh, that kind of, you know, postmodernist criticism. And I thought, I'm going to give this guy a name that means puzzle. And a rebus is a picture puzzle. It's a way of sending a message through little drawings with letters added or taken away. Um, and when I was growing up as a, as a kid, there was a newspaper and I had a kind of cartoons and stuff for kids to do. And they had a rebus. I didn't know that's what it was called, but it had a rebus in it every week, which I really enjoyed doing. Um, so I gave him the name, thinking I'm only going to use this guy for one book. It's a little in joke. It's you know, it's something that people who appreciate literary criticism and postmodernism will enjoy. I think I gave him the first name John, by the way, because of John Shaft, who was one of the first detectives I really liked uh, when I was a kid. I wasn't old enough to be allowed in to see the movies, the Shaft movies, but nobody stopped me buying the cheap paperback books. So I, I had all the Shaft books by Ernest Tideman sitting on my shelf as a kid. Um, so it's not true that I didn't read any crime fiction. I did read some, but it was mostly stuff from Hollywood movies. Uh, yeah, and then a few years later, quite a few years later, um, I was in a bar in Edinburgh and I was introduced to a guy called Joe Rebus, uh, a real person who lives in Rankin Drive in Edinburgh. That's the street he lives in. It's a complete coincidence. And he told me it was a Polish surname. So after that, I had Rebus's backstory. And it kind of chimed as well, because after World War II, a lot of Poles did move to the UK and a lot of them moved to Scotland. Uh, so yeah, so Rebus's family came from Poland, but I didn't discover that until about book number 11 or 12 in the series. As Rebus was beginning to tell you his backstory, what were some of the most key details for you structurally as you built out what became the dogged investigator that he was on the page? Rebus leaves school at 15. Uh, he's got very few qualifications. And at that time, if you're working class growing up in Scotland, you've got very few job opportunities. You tend to join the armed forces or try and get an apprenticeship somewhere or maybe join the police. And he joins the army and uh, trains for the SAS, but is not successful. Um, but in his early years in the army, he is sent to Northern Ireland. It was the late 60s, things started to go a bit mad, a bit crazy in Northern Ireland, and an awful lot of the armed forces were sent there, specifically the, the British Army were sent there. 
So that was where the trouble was. That's where the army went. Um, and it just seemed logical to me that he might be one of those people. My wife, who I met at university when we were in our early 20s, she grew up in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. So it's a place that I know fairly well ever since I've been dating her. Um, we were back there just a few weeks ago for her mum's 90th birthday. So I've seen it in various permutations. Um, and yeah, I just thought it would be interesting to give Rebus a backstory that involved that very violent conflict, because that's at a time when, you know, otherwise, if he was in the army, he wouldn't be seen an awful lot of armed conflict. Uh, he could be stationed in Germany, but not much is happening uh, or elsewhere, but not much would be happening. But in Northern Ireland, wow, everything was happening. With Floods and Crosses, the book where we first meet Rebus, the legend of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde's a play in the backdrop, correct? Yeah, I mean, it was meant to be a, a rewriting of Jekyll and Hyde, that first book. You were meant to think that Rebus, this detective, was potentially also the killer. Um, he was having blackouts, there was a locked room in his apartment that he never went into, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and I was obsessed with Jekyll and Hyde. Jekyll and Hyde is, is a book that was written by an Edinburgh author, Robert Louis Stevenson, partly based on real Edinburgh characters, um, but set in London. And I just wanted to drag it back to its Edinburgh roots and give it a contemporary sheen. But nobody got it. I mean, when the book was published, it was just seen as being, you know, a whodunit, uh, a mystery novel. And nobody really got the, the Jekyll and Hyde. So the next book I wrote with Rebus in it had the word Hyde in the title. I called it Hide and Seek. And I've got a gentleman's club called Hides with a Y which is where rich guys go to get their rocks off by watching young kids do terrible things to each other. Spoiler alert. Uh, but um, yeah, I, and, and you know, that continued and uh, I still reference Jekyll and Hyde probably more than any other work. Well, wow, so it echoes throughout the entire series. Why did you feel it was the perfect setting to hang this sort of haunting mythology over? Because to me, Edinburgh was a Jekyll and Hyde city. I mean, all cities are, I guess, but Edinburgh's got this reputation. It's cultured, it's civilized, it's clean and safe and everything else. But when I was a student here, it had terrible problems with drugs and prostitution and unemployment. Uh, train spotting, Urban Welsh's book would be written a little bit later on. We'd deal with some of that. And I just thought there are these two Edinburghs. There's the Edinburgh of the haves and the Edinburgh of the have-nots. And... Uh, so Stevenson's Edinburgh, to me, was very much still alive. Rebus hunts down some truly memorable antagonists over the course of his crime-fighting career, and Wolfman is no exception. Was this based on any real-life villain from Edinburgh, from its past? Uh, you know, I was, I, was, I was pretty stupid when I was young. I mean, I'd written a book called Watchmen, which was my attempt at a spy novel. Then I wrote a book called West Wind, which was my attempt at a big, fat thriller, international conspiracy thriller. I thought, I'm going to write a Rebus novel. I'm going to give it a W title. I'm going to have a serial killer. What will they call him? It begins with W, Wolfman. just seemed to be. Uh, and then my American publisher didn't like the title. In the UK, it was published as Wolfman, but in the States, they changed it to Tooth and Nail, which I thought was a better title. So later on in the UK, we changed it to Tooth and Nail as well. Um, I was enthralled to the serial killer novel. You know, I mean, I was, I was not making much money. I wasn't at that time a full-time writer. I was looking at Thomas Harris with Hannibal Lecter and thinking, okay, is this how you, is this how you do it? Is this how you become successful? You've got a very Rococo serial killer. Um, so, you know, yeah. So my guy is very heavily based on uh, the killer from the first Hannibal Lecter book. Whether it's a sex scandal in hide and seek, corrupt politicians and stripjack, or suspicious suicides and let it bleed, you tackle very realistic criminal scenarios that we read about every day in the paper. Did you pick some of those plots right out of the headlines? Most of my books begin with a... Uh, a kernel, a seed that is that is taken from the newspapers or the magazines, um, uh, and uh, yeah, I was I was a, a sucker for for, for it, well, the thing was I, I was a sucker for the news. I was about to say I, I used to read the news a lot and listen to the news, and I still do. The thing was I wanted people to believe in these books, and you know there would be people out there who would pick one up and go, oh, that really happened, uh, or something like that happened, but not in Scotland. Um, and so, yeah, and then bizarrely often some, you know, something would happen afterwards. So Hide and Seek, the second Rebus novel, which is about this cabal of rich men and uh, using male prostitutes, etc., etc. A few years after it was published, police in Edinburgh started to investigate a rumour 
um, that this was happening. It was judges and lawyers were consorting with rent boys and, and being blackmailed by them as a result. And it was apparently a list of names of all these men that was in police headquarters in Edinburgh and was stolen. Uh, it was stolen because someone could break in by opening, no, a, a w open, an open window. They went in through an open window on the ground floor and went into an unlocked filing cabinet where this list was. It was just ridiculous. But anyway, people then went, oh, you know what's going on. How did you know several years ago that this was actually happening? And so I got a, you know, I got a reputation of someone who actually knew what was going on. And I liked, I've always liked to play that game with the reader that they go, hang on a minute, that really happened. So maybe everything else in this book is true as well. You're definitely a master at that craft. The Black Book is one of my favorite and most brilliant examples of that art in action on the canvas, so to speak. But, I mean, there was a, a, a hotel on Princess Street that had burned down in mysterious circumstances. And that gave me the starting point for that book. I thought, well, who burned it down? Why did it burn down? What happened there? What were they trying to cover up? Uh, and then you just let your fevered uh, Gothic imagination do the rest. Rebus has some very unique methods that he employs to cracking the cases you give him to solve, book in and out. Did any law enforcement sources help you put those together? You know, I was lucky that I was getting published early on. I was learning the craft. Some writers don't get published. They have to learn the craft first. So each book, I felt, was getting better than the book before, getting more confident, taking on bigger themes, um, uh, you know, geographically getting wider and, and everything else, and just getting more complex storylines and two or three storylines intertwining. And that was all, I was learning all of that as I did it. And I was just lucky that I was also getting published at the same time. And I decided that Rebus would exist in real time. So he gets, he, he's, he's only, um, uh, he goes from being a detective sergeant, which he is in book one, to detective inspector. And then he never goes above that because I'd got to know cops. And cops told me that once you go above the rank of detective inspector, basically you just sit in an office. You don't go out investigating crimes anymore. Um, so I thought, no, I want this guy to be out on the streets. That's where he feels comfortable. So he's going to age in real time, but he's not going to rise above Detective Inspector. He is, of course, a maverick. He's an outsider. They're always more interesting people to write about. He's got a busted marriage. He's got a, a daughter that he seldom sees. Um, and I was, you know, I was kind of making it up as I went along, but I was growing in confidence and giving him more to do. And I'd give him sidekicks and then think, no, he doesn't actually need a sidekick. And then think, no, actually he does. The reader needs him to have a sidekick so they can ask the questions we want to ask, as happens with Holmes and, and Watson. Um, and all of that was, you know, this growing in confidence and, and selling more books and selling a few more books and a few more books. It was, it, was a, it was a long, slow process, but it was very good. And if I'd become an overnight success with book one, I would have lost all of that uh, learning curve. And that learning curve has stood me in good stead. Turning to those sidekicks, who were a few of your personal favorites to write throughout the series? You know, I liked um, Templar. I thought she was good. She was Rebus's boss in the first book, but they end up having a relationship. I just thought there's no way that can continue. She can't continue to be his boss and them have a relationship and work together and all the rest of it. Um, and, I, you know, through the course of the series, I've, there have been lots of women who have come and gone from Rebus's life. He has learned, the lesson he's learned is that people close to him tend to get hurt. Sometimes it's his fault and sometimes it isn't. So he has actually pushed people away almost psychologically and physically pushed them away because he doesn't want people around him who will then end up getting hurt. Um, yeah, I mean, Brian Holmes, I thought was, a, was, a, was an interesting character. Uh, uh, there's a journalist in some of the early books that I liked a lot, um, so much so that I actually brought him into my London-based spy novel, which actually wasn't a Rebus book, but I brought him in there anyway. Jim Steele. Um, yeah, 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 you're better than this than I am. I've, you know, I've been writing these books for a long time. I've forgotten most of the names. Jack Morton. Jack Morton was Rebus's kind of sidekick very early on. And then, sadly, he, he, he didn't make it, you know. And I didn't know until I pulled the trigger that he was going to die. Uh, the book told me. And that's happened a lot of times, you know. Rebus was friendly with a priest, and the priest died. And I, I didn't really want that to happen. But it, the book said it has to happen. It must happen. Uh, um, so I'm kind of at the mercy of these stories. Once the story gets going, it's got a logic of its own and a mind of its own. And I'm, I just kind of hang on for dear life while it takes me where it wants to take me. Alongside the Wolfman, who are some of your favorite villains to face Rebus off with throughout the years? The Weasel comes right to mind. Okay, we've got Morris Gerald Cafferty, Big Jer Cafferty, who is a, he's a gangster. He's an old school gangster. Again, the dinosaur, the last of his kind. And he's still hanging on in there. I mean, God bless him. He's been around for a lot of books now. Um, he was invented because I needed Rebus to be in Glasgow to do something. I thought, why is he 
why is he in Glasgow rather than Edinburgh? Always oh, in Glasgow, giving evidence in a court case. Who's in the court? Uh, a Glasgow gangster. So Cafferty was invented to be a Glasgow gangster rather than an Edinburgh gangster. And actually, in the series, if you read it closely, you'll see there are two completely different backstories for Cafferty. Um, I, I just I screwed up. So in one of them, he's born and brought up in Glasgow, and in one of them, he's born and brought up in Edinburgh because I'd forgotten. Uh, there's a few mistakes in there uh, tucked away. Um, yeah, and I thought he would have someone like the Weasley, they have a kind of lieutenant uh, who's sort of going out and on the streets and is a bit kind of scuzzy. So he can sort of, you know, he's invisible to, to most people because he's just a kind of scuzzy, looks like a, a homeless person. Um, and he's, you, you, can't you can't trust him. So hence the name Weasel. Uh, so yeah, immediately when you give him that name, you conjure up a face. I think you conjure up the clothes and the face and the body. A bit like in Dickens. When Dickens gives you a name of a character, you kind of know what they're going to look like. Um, and I enjoyed doing that with a lot of the characters. Vanderhyde was another one. I think I got Vanderhyde from the phone book as a surname, but I just wanted the word Hyde uh, because he pops up in Hide and Seek. I just wanted to get the word, the name Hyde into one of my books. And I was just thrilled when I found there was a real person called Vanderhyde living in Edinburgh. I used to go through the phone books a lot for characters and uh, also real people would pay money to charity to be in the book. So sometimes, and they always want to be goodies. They never want to really be, actually that's not true. Some want to be baddies. Um, but uh, but that's always been a lot of fun as well. Names are, you know, I, I've got a lot, I've a lot of fun making up names. I do enjoy making up a good name. You remain consistently original, that's for sure. And this is actually the first time in the show we've had an author talk about fans bidding at a charity auction to have their names used in books. Bible John was another I wanted to ask you about from Black and Blue. When did he first come to you? Here's the thing. Bible John was the breakthrough. Uh, Black and Blue was the breakthrough book, um, heavily influenced by James Elroy. Elroy, when I discovered, used real characters sometimes, real gangsters, real crimes in his books. I thought, oh, hey, maybe I can do that a bit more than I have done. I looked at the most famous unsolved case in Scottish history, and it was a killer called Bible John, who was active in the late 60s. We think he killed three women, met them at a dance hall in Glasgow, um, killed them, and then just disappeared. Huge manhunt, but he was never found. I thought, well, I'm going to give that an ending. Uh, I'm going to bring some closure to this uh, in a fictional sense. And I got the idea for a, a, you know, a, a, a wannabe Bible John, someone who's mimicking him, a serial killer mimicking him in the present day. Uh, and this annoys the real Bible John because he doesn't want anybody taking his mantle, you know, stealing his glory. So he decides he's going to go up, he's going to have to go out and find the serial killer before the police do. Now, my books don't usually come to me as high concept as that. I mean, that is an elevator pitch, I would say. Usually my books are, oh, I'd like to write about this, and maybe if I do that, it'll allow me to address this theme, and if I bring these characters in, I can do this. And I just build the book together slowly, but that one, it was boom. It was Bible John trying to find the killer who's mimicking him. And, and you know, I was always, for, for years after that, I was always a little bit nervous when I did events that when I looked in the audience, I would see someone who would actually be Bible John, uh, who would be coming to get me. That right there sounds like a great plot for a novel, an author being stalked by a real serial killer featured in his book. With the IRA backdrop to moral clauses, were you worried about anything in terms of actually writing about them on the page? I think it's problem. I think it's, I think it, it's potentially problematic if you're a novelist, if people think they can see themselves in your books and they don't like what you're saying about them. Um, so yeah, gangsters, for example, I've had Glasgow gangsters say they think that they're, you know, Caffer is based on them or other characters in the books are based on them. Um, or even more troubling is when they say they're thinking of writing a book and will I help them? They're going to come to me for help, dear God. Um, uh, you know, I, there was one woman who uh, was in, lived in a tough estate, a tough working class kind of project uh, in, in a small city in Scotland called Stirling. Um, and she had roused the local community to basically kick a, a paedophile uh, off their turf. Um, and that gave me the start of the book Dead Souls. I just got the idea. Of, and so there's a character very like her. Well, when I did the first event for Dead Souls, I did it in Sterling, and she was sitting front and center, tapping the book, looking at me and pointing. I know I know who this is based on. I know what you did here. Uh, and I was really, she was a pretty scary person. I was kind of, I, I, was, I was a little bit worried. But in fact, afterwards we chatted and she was okay. But yeah, it happens, you know, it happens. Uh, the Northern Ireland stuff, not so much. I think anybody, because I'd never really lived there, I do know writers who live in Northern Ireland and do write about the troubles, as they are euphemistically called. Uh, and they've always got to be pretty careful 
um, who they're writing about and how they're writing about them. Um, and sometimes I've just, you know, sometimes I've not pulled the pin. For example, that book, Dead Souls, which was based on a real, you know, based on a true story of a paedophile who was outed and chased off the community. In my version, he's, he's killed and he's been outed by Rebus, who then feels a bit guilty and decides that he's got to find the killer. Um, and I, I originally I was going to get, I was going to do the sections from the paedophile's point of view in the first person. And I thought, no, I don't want to do that. I had two young kids and I just, it was maybe moral cowardice, which is something maybe novelists shouldn't have, but the, you know, and maybe everybody's got their lines. They don't want to cross or they can't cross. I just thought, I don't want to share headspace with you. Years ago, I did a TV documentary about evil and I got fantastic access, extraordinary access. Um, to the people I wanted to speak to. My producer, unbeknownst to me, wrote to a serial killer um, called Ian Brady, one of the Moors murderers, um, infamous in, in UK history. Wrote to him in his, in his asylum, uh, his psychiatric hospital. And, and Brady wrote back and said, because it, it, no, sorry, this is wrong. What happened was the producer wrote to Brady's mother and said, can we interview you about what it's like being Ian Brady's mother? She sent that on to Brady, who got in touch with the producer and, and said, no, Mr. Rankin doesn't talk to my mum. He comes and talks to me. And I said, and the producer was very excited about this. And I said, no way am I going near that guy because he was all about mind games, Brady, all about the mind games. Um, he wrote the only book I've ever read that would gladly see burnt, which was an apologia for serial killers. But um, so I wouldn't do it. You know, I, I, I just wouldn't go there. Um, and so I let the producer down. Now he did, the producer did do other stuff for me. I mean, I was exorcised by a priest in Rome and uh, went to death row in Texas, Huntsville, Texas, to talk to a guy who'd been on death row for 10 years and uh, you know, so on and so forth. Being born in a rural coal mining village in Scotland, when you reflect back on your upbringing, did you ever think that first picking up a book and then a pen would take you to such great heights as you've gone throughout your career? Uh, well, you know, I mean, I started reading at a young age, but it was mostly comics. It was mostly Batman and Superman. Um, my parents weren't great readers. They probably only read books during the summer vacation when we went away. So there weren't many books in the house, but I, um, and there weren't, there wasn't a bookshop in my village. It was a coal mining village. Um, there was a news agents that had kind of cheap paperbacks. That was about it. But we had a library, a small library that had been endowed um, by a local guy called Carnegie. You probably heard of him. Uh, and he was from Dunfermline near where I grew up. And um, so I used to haunt that place. And one of the most exciting days was when he said, Ian, you're now old enough to go from the children's section to the adult section. Oh, let me in about it. And I was reading thrillers, you know, I was reading, uh, I mean, James Bond and reading Alistair MacLean was a big one. He was, I didn't even know he was Scottish. Turns out he was a Scot. He was one of the biggest thriller writers in the world in the 60s. Every book he wrote was made into a Hollywood movie, usually with Rock Hudson or somebody. Clint Eastwood, I mean, Where Eagles Dare, uh, one of those great movies, uh, Ice Station Zebra, he, he wrote all of those. Um, but yeah, those, I mean, it was it was thrillers mostly I was reading. Um, and then at school one day, someone passed me a copy of A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess. And that film had been withdrawn from circulation in the UK because there had been copycat violence. And uh, Kubrick, the director, withdrew it because he didn't like the fact that people had been carrying out copycat violence based on the film. So I read the book and I just thought this is phenomenal. Um, it was about a kind of world that I knew. It was about young, young violent men and, uh, and gang culture. Uh, but it was written beautifully. It was written in a very literary fashion. And so that I started writing things, trying to copy the style and just writing things down, trying to write about my village and write about the violent young men in my village, but doing it in a kind of literary way. Wow, please give us a little bit of an insight into what that process was like as you started turning life into art on the page. It was kind of weird because, you know, I left primary school. Primary school is where you got until the age of 12 in 1972, summer 72. And seven weeks later, when I went to high school, everything had changed. All the guys were wearing these Doc Martin boots, these really big, heavy boots with steel toe caps. They were dressing like a gang. They had short skinhead haircuts and they wore certain jackets and, and everything. And I was like, whoa. And, you know, I had to get this gear because if you didn't fit in, if you looked different, then you were going to get bullied, you were going to get set upon, or you were always going to be an outsider. So I became a chameleon very early on. So I'd be hanging around the street corner in my village, scowling at any cars that passed through. Um, 
but at the same time, you know, whenever a big fight was mooted, like, oh, the village next door, we're going to go and fight them. I would go, oh, guys, I've got to go home and get my dinner. Uh, and I would go and hide in my bedroom and write about it. I would imagine it. Uh, I wouldn't actually take part in the violence. But it was pretty, it was pretty ugly, you know. I mean, you, every village around about used to have, had a gang. Our gang were the, um, the uh, YCD, Young Card and Den. The really scary gang were the next village over. They were the YLM, the Young Loch Gelly Mental. Uh, the village was called Loch Gelly, and mental just means crazy. Um, but yeah, and they would sort of get together in the seafront in Kirkcaldy and places of these massed battles and stuff. Uh, it was, yeah, it made you fearful. It made you fearful. And, you know, I had a poetic soul. I was listening to prog rock and I was writing song lyrics and poems to girls I couldn't talk to in school. But on the surface, I have to look like this rough, tough, you know, uh, gang member it was kind of, it was weirdly dislocative. And I guess that's where the Jekyll and Hyde stuff maybe comes from. Because Jekyll, Jekyll is this kind of cultured man, but he gives in to his baser impulses. I have to imagine attending University of Edinburgh was an escape of sorts from everything going out on the street. Oh, totally, man. Oh, my God. I would, suddenly I was meeting my people. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it wasn't the classes that I went to that were important. It was everything else. It was all the extracurricular stuff. I was meeting people who wanted to be playwrights and poets and singers. Let's get a band together. OK, let's do it. Uh, let's make a film, let's put on a play, let's have a magazine, uh, let, you know, let's put on events, let's review movies, uh, you know, just everything. Um, and I got very, very involved in that. And I was meeting people who, who were as excited by literature as I was. It was still tough. I mean, the first two years, having to read stuff like, I don't know, Wordsworth or Thomas Hardy, that wasn't really my bag. Um, but I got through it and I got to the really good stuff, which was American literature. That's what I really wanted to do as an undergraduate. And eventually I got there and I was in bands and I was writing you know, poems and eventually short stories and uh, yeah, trying to get published, getting lots of rejection letters. Uh, it was next. And of course, it was a time of punk. I mean, that was also hugely important to me. In 1978, I got to Edinburgh University, October 78, the first band I saw. Uh, the student freshers week, as we call it, the week for the kind of new students. The first band was the Ramones. I mean, how great is that for your first week at university? And all these little clubs sprang up and all these little local bands sprang up and you could go and see a gig every day of the week. And the punk aesthetic, really, or the philosophy, I should say, the punk philosophy was just do it, give it a go. It doesn't matter what school you went to. It doesn't matter if you know any contacts or if you've got any talent. You know, what be in a band? Pick up a guitar. Want to be a writer? Get writing. I'm curious, as you started studying American literature, any authors who then became an influence in your style of writing as it was developing? Well, I mean, a big one in American lit was Thomas Pynchon. Um, I mean, I, I, I just went down a whole conspiracy wormhole of his, uh, you know, all the stuff he wrote about all these very complex plots, ridiculous plots. I just felt, you know, I had a, I had a, a, a jacket um, that I got from a charity store. And I put the, the kind of muted trumpet on the back, which is one of one of the symbols he uses in um, the crime a lot 49. Um, I just I just fell for that big time. But there was a kind of renaissance of Scottish literature at the time. It wasn't being taught in university, but because I was in various writers groups, I was getting to meet these writers. The big one at the time was was um, uh, Alistair Gray. Lanark was this big breakthrough book. He was an artist as well as a writer. It was a very complex book. It was partly set in the future, partly set in the past. Um, it was it about two people or one person? We were never very sure. But it was a it was a kind of clarion call that Scottish literature was was big. And then there were writers like William McIlvanny, who was a literary novelist and a poet, but he'd also written a couple of crime novels. Hugely important to me when I was starting to think about writing about Rebus because he made it okay to write crime fiction, to write about detective, because he did it and he was a literary novelist. So it must be literature. Um, and I met him in the early eighties. I met him for the first time at a book festival. And he I was, said, I was writing a book about a cop and it was based heavily on his, Laidlaw was the name of his character. It was based heavily on his Laidlaw novels. And he wrote Good Luck with the Edinburgh Laidlaw on the inside of my book, which I thought was, was really fun. Um, yeah, all of that was important. There was a kind of buzz. There was a real buzz about the place and a real sense that things were happening. They weren't always happening in the uh, lecture theatres, but they were happening somewhere nearby. It sounds like an amazing amount of literary culture to be surrounded by. And it's against this backdrop you begin working on your first book while still in college, The Flood. I'm not mistaken. 
Yeah, I'd written I'd written novels before that. At high school, I wrote a novel that must have been 20 pages long about a young guy who's misunderstood in his village and goes to London and drowns. Uh, then I wrote a comedy set in a hotel in the Highlands of Scotland called Summer Rights. That I sent it off for publication and everybody turned it down, so it went in the bottom drawer. And then The Flood came along. The Flood was a, a short story that raged out of control, again, about a young guy growing up pretty much where I grew up. Uh, feeling misunderstood and his adventures and misadventures in life. Um, and it was a very small publishing house in Edinburgh, independent publishing house that had been started by the students. And again, it, it grew from punk. Let's start a publishing house. Um, and so I was one of the first, the very first author they took was a guy called James Kelman, who eventually won the Booker Prize. Um, they took his first book of short stories and his first novel. And on the success of that, they were looking for new young writers. Uh, and I gave him the flood. And they published it. And it was a, what a buzz that was. Uh, and in fact, it was the same day. I know this because I used to keep a page a day diary. But the day I went in to sign the contract in their office for the flood, I then went back to my student apartment and sat down and got the idea for Rebus. <laughs> and it's the self same day. It was the strangest thing. Sounds like serendipity at work. Over the next couple novels that followed, Watchmen and then West Wind, why were you intrigued by the spy backdrop to make that such a key feature of both books? You know, I don't know that I was engrossed by the spy world, but I loved um, Graham Greene. And Graham Greene had written a spy novel called The Human Factor. And my attempt, uh, Watchmen, was just really my attempt at rewriting Graham Greene's The Human Factor. I, by this time, I was living in London. I'd left university and I'd moved to London with my wife. She had a job I didn't. Um, and I just thought, what kind of book can I write about London? And a spy novel seemed to suggest itself. You had Le Carre and stuff like that, you know, as a... And, I just thought maybe a spy novel. And I was also looking for, what can I write that will sell? I want to be a full-time writer. I want to be a successful writer. What can I write that's going to make me some money? And when the spy novel didn't work out, I then wrote West Wind, which was you know, a big fat conspiracy theory thriller. That didn't sell either. Um, and to fast forward a couple of years, my wife and I then moved to France and suddenly I was the main breadwinner. And one Rebus novel a year wasn't going to do it. I wasn't, they weren't selling well. I wasn't making enough money. So I was having to write two books a year. And my publisher did not want two Rebus novels a year. They were finding it difficult enough to sell one. So along comes Jack Harvey. And I wrote under a pseudonym and I wrote three big fat thrillers just to make some cash. <laughs> and as soon as, as soon as I could afford to, to drop Jack Harvey, I did. But we'll consider that section of your catalog covered then. By the time you were a decade into writing the Rebus series, with The Hanging Garden and Set in the Darkness, I imagine he spoke to you in a pretty intuitive voice by then as a lead character. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, the early books were The Apprenticeship, and by the time I got to Black and Blue, which is a much meatier book, a much longer book, a much more complex book, The Apprenticeship was over. That book won the Gold Dagger. It was shortlisted for the Edgar in, in America. It was my breakthrough book. Uh, and after that, yeah, I was, I was more confident. I was making a bit more money. I thought, okay, I can make a go of this. Um, I still wasn't hitting the top 10, but you know, I was selling enough to get by. Um, Hanging Garden was based on a, on a true story, a place we were living in. We were living in France and near us was a place called Oradour where an atrocity had taken place towards the end of World War II. And I used that as the backdrop. Again, weirdly, I, I thought, how can I write about this from an Edinburgh perspective? Oh, I know, I'll have a guy living quietly in Edinburgh who you know, might've been involved in this atrocity. And then, like, when the book was published, it turned out there was a, you know, suspected Nazi war criminal living quietly in Edinburgh uh, who had been investigated by a TV documentary, and, and he was about to sue them. And I think he was thinking about suing me as well. But luckily for me, he died uh, of old age before he could. Um, so, yeah, there was all that stuff going on. Um, I felt confident about Rebus by then. I didn't know. I've never known what he looks like, but I knew the inside of his head. I think I had his voice his mannerisms. I knew he drank at the Oxford Bar, a real bar where I also drink. He would still be living in Arden Street in Edinburgh, even though it's mostly students who live there, not cops. Um, I gave him some ver various family permutations. You know, a brother came and went, his wife and his daughter came and went. Uh, but he's mostly, he was mostly a loner. He's mostly happiest with a bottle of malt whiskey, sitting in his record album strewn living room listening to the stones or van morrison or something um while the night descends outside i can i know that because i can that kind of is me you know um put me in a room with a with a hi-fi system and a bottle of whiskey and i'm happy 
How much fun was it for you as you got into later books in the series like Resurrection Men, A Question of Blood, Flesh Market Clothes, The Naming of the Dead and Exit Music, especially adding a new sidekick in Siobhan Clark? Yeah, I mean, I'd given Reba sidekicks and then I thought, no, he's not really a sidekick kind of guy. He's a real loner. But then I thought, no, he really needs someone to bounce things off and the reader needs someone to be asking him the questions they want the answers to. And Siobhan Clark arrived on the scene. Siobhan Clark arrived... And I'm not exactly sure why, but she just she was there. And I thought, well, it's a, it's a young woman. That's going to be interesting for him as like an older, cynical guy. She's college educated. Uh, she's born in Scotland, but brought up in England. So she's actually got an English accent, which, again, makes her a little bit different. So there's quite a lot for Rebus to for me to play with in their relationship. Um, and you know, she's got her own way of doing things. Um, she is not a maverick. She's not an outsider. And she knows that if she is, then she's not going to progress through the ranks of the police. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword being closely linked to Rebus because he can drag you down. Um, but she tries to teach him that there's more than one way of looking at the world. Rebus really sees, sees the world in a binary way, black and white, good and evil. Um, once someone's a villain, they're always a villain. Whereas Siobhan is she's more like me she's trying she's more liberal in her views and her politics and everything else and she's trying to teach rebus that there's a much more nuanced way of looking at the world um that people can change that people can can come out of jail and not you know reoffend etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah i like her a lot and she's been incredibly useful to me and of course you know as rebus creeps towards retirement there's always the thought at the back of your mind that maybe she can hold down a series. And I've often thought about, you know, giving her a book of her own, but I've not found a story yet that feels like it's her story. Something that's really, really going to grab her and that she's going to work away at. So I'm still waiting for that magic dust to land. Well, I imagine fans are too, especially after hearing that reveal. You touched on aging Rebus, which you've done in real time throughout the series, even braving him into retirement a bit while still finding ways to keep him on the front line fighting crime. Tell us a bit about how you pulled that trick off. So it got to the point where Rebus had to retire, and, and I thought, well, okay, can I, can I still write about him? And I found ways to do it. Um, and readers still wanted to read about him, even though he's no longer a cop, because he is still a detective uh, to his very DNA. He still wants to get involved. But he's an old-fashioned cop. He's, he, he depends on the streets. He depends on contacts. He depends on talking to people and actually going places and doing stuff. Um, he, he doesn't, you know, use the internet, CCTV, people's cell phones, none of that. That doesn't interest him. All that tech stuff happens somewhere else. He's still, he's a bit of a dinosaur now because he's the last of that breed of cop that used to exist. We meet another of Rebus's recent maystays, D.I. Malcolm Fox, first in the complaints and then for eight bestsellers that follow, concluding most recently with a song for Dark Times. Tell us why it made sense to team him up with Malcolm at that point. Exit Music comes along. Exit Music is the final Rebus book because I've been told by a cop I know that if you're a detective in the police force in Scotland, you have to retire at 60. And I know I know that that's what Rebus is. So Exit Music, he retires. That should be the last book. So Rebus disappears. I'm not going to write about him again. But I still want to write about cops and I still want to write about Edinburgh. And I'd been reading up about uh, internal affairs. And I thought, well, this is interesting because nobody, if I write about internal affairs and a cop who works in internal affairs, nobody's going to see Rebus. They're not going to think it's Rebus Light or Rebus 2.0. This has got to be a very different character, the kind of character who would investigate a cop like Rebus, who breaks the rules all the time. Um, so that was Malcolm Fox. Fox came along, a big bear of a guy who's a bit, of, a bit in the first book, a little bit boring, you know, because he's, he obeys the rules and he doesn't want to break the rules, et cetera, et cetera. But he gets the job done. And, and I thought, well, he's an interesting enough character. I'm going to give him a second story. So I give him a second story. Um, but then I got an idea for a book, and I thought, hang on, I, this this it's a cold case, and there's a unit in Edinburgh that deals with cold cases, unsolved cases, and that unit is staffed almost entirely by retired detectives. I'm, if I'm going to write the story, I need, a, I need a retired detective. Well, I could make one up, but I've already got one. So Rebus comes back and the first page of that, I remember being terrified that his voice would have gone because it had been five years since I'd written about him or really much thought about him. And the book opens at a funeral and Rebus is there. He's as far back from the other funeral um, people as he can be. And he's just desperate for a cigarette. And I thought, yeah, you're back. It's like, you, it's like I've just unlocked that little cell and you've come leaping out into my head again. Um, and so, yeah, I, I thought he'll stick around for a few books, working cold cases. Then yeah, it got to the point where he would have to re-retire. Um, and I thought, can I keep writing about him? But 
you know, I just keep finding things for him to do. Um, I just keep finding stories, and he seems like still the perfect person to investigate or to front the story or to tell my story. I've talked to a lot of your UK brethren on the show about having their series adapted to TV, some to favorable results and others not. For you, when you heard Rebus was going that route with John Hanna and then Ken Scott, how did you feel about it once you watched it? Well, I never watched it. I've never watched um, the TV shows. There have been two actors who played Rebus uh, during the course of that. And I decided early on, I, I, I phoned up a few crime writers whose work had been put on TV. I said, do I get involved? Yeah, you get involved if you want. Don't get involved. I said, but it will change the way you write about your characters. Uh, I went, well, I don't want that to happen. So I decided that I would not get involved and I would not watch. So I've got the DVDs and stuff sitting here on my shelves, but I've never watched an episode. It's still on TV late at night, once a week. Uh, and I, I sometimes I flip past it when I'm, when I'm sort of, you know, going from channel to channel. But I've not watched a whole episode. So uh, it wasn't much fun for me. And I think fans were, you know, the stories were so compressed um, that fans felt a little bit cheated. I mean, to take a Rebus novel, 400 pages, and compress it to 60 minutes of TV or 90 minutes of TV, which is a 60 or 90 page script, you, you know, you're throwing out all the good stuff. All the good stuff is getting thrown out. You've had some colorful creative partnerships over the course of your career, whether co-writing Dark Road with Mark Thompson or an opera with Craig Armstrong. And most recently, you teamed up with one of your heroes, the late great William McIlvaney, to finish The Dark Remains. You must have really been excited about that one. Yeah, the thing about collaboration is it's very different and novelists aren't used to doing it. So it makes me think in a different way. It, it gives me challenges. So doing a play when you're sitting there with someone and, and they're saying, well, you can't have this many characters and it can't take place over this length of time and you've got to have... You've got to have a set that can have doors in it and they can't suddenly costume change and time can't suddenly jump. And um, all these things when I'm writing plays, uh, it's a learning curve. Um, and and yeah, writing the opera was, was a huge learning curve. A libretto uh, based on a real life character uh, uh, called Gesualdo. And uh, yeah, there was, it was, it was, they've, they've all been fun in different ways, but the thing is it keeps you on your toes. You don't get lazy, you don't get blasé because suddenly you're learning new tricks. And I think writers always need to be learning new tricks. And I hope that I, you know, if I ever said, that's the nice thing about Rebus aging in real time is the books are never the same. No two books are the same because he has moved on in his life. He's not the guy he was in that previous book. His relationships are not the same. The police force is not the same. Scotland is not the same. So that's been really good for me because it keeps me on my toes. And the latest Rebus novel, I took him way up to the north coast of Scotland to get him way out of his comfort zone and get me out of my comfort zone. And that book was written during lockdown. So that was a joy. That was my escape tunnel from oh. COVID. Can fans look forward to Rebus returning to the page anytime soon? I, I'm not working. I mean, I, I mean, having finished um, A Song for the Dark Times, I then got involved in this book, finishing off a, a manuscript that Willie McIlvaney had started. We're going to talk about that. Then as soon as that was finished, I got involved in a TV project, which uh, took up the first half of this year. Then I had to write a stage play. So I've just finished writing a stage play and Rebus is in the stage play. What's the title? And would you tell us a bit more about writing posthumously with William McIlvaney? That's fascinating. Oh, I'm not going to, I better not tell you that. I've told you too much already. Um, cause it's not been, you know, we've not, we've got a producer, but we've nobody's agreed to put it on yet. So it might be, it might jinx it if I tell you what it's called. But anyway, so I've done that. The next book I write is probably not going to be a Rebus novel. It's going to be a, a high concept thriller, I think. And then the year after that will be Rebus. Um, yeah. But you know, the, the, I literally just finished writing, um, a song for the dark times. And then a publisher came, came, came to me and said, look, we've got, some manuscript pages by William McIlvaney. We've already spoken about him. He was a huge influence on me. His laid law crime novels were a huge influence on me. He had died a few years before. He'd left some handwritten pages for a, a, a laid law novel, not having written one for decades. And his widow had typed him up and given him to the publisher and said, do you think, anything, you know, is there enough here to get a story, a book? What? So they asked me if I would look at it and give my advice. And I said, well, yeah, if you do X, Y, Z and bring this in and do that and do that, you could probably get a short novel from, from these notes. And I said, well, will you do it? She wants you to do it. And I thought, well, it's quite, a, he's got a very different style to me. Much more poetic um, uh, style. And also his books are set in Glasgow and this one was gonna be set in 1972. 1972, I was 12 years old and living in the other side of the country. So I thought it's gonna be a hell of a challenge, but, um, I would like him to get a new audience and people to remember that he was a great writer and to remember him and, and come and read his books again. So I, I decided to give it a go. 
And my wife will tell you it was hard work, getting inside his head, making sure it was him, not me. It was an act of ventriloquism. Um, and uh, it was sent to the, his, his widow and she wrote me a lovely handwritten letter to say two things. One was that she couldn't see the join. She couldn't see the join where it stopped being him and started being me. And the second thing was that it was like he was in the room with her again, like he was sitting next to her as she read his words. So that, for me, that's a success. You know, even if the book sells zero copies when it's published in September, that's still a success for me. Along with McIlvaney, I understand we're both big Lawrence Block fans. For me, it's Scudder. It's always Scudder for me, the Matt Scudder books. Um, they, they were a huge influence on Rebus as well, especially um, uh, Mick Ballou. Mick Ballou is basically a big Jer Cafferty. I mean, Cafferty is a homage to the to gangster Mick Ballou in the, the Scudder novels. And I've told, I've told Lawrence Block that. Um, one of the great thrills about becoming a successful writer is I've got to share stages with these people. I've got to share stages with McIlvaney. I've got to share a stage with Lawrence Block. Um, all the writers I've admired, I've ended up, you know, being able to meet, uh, talk to them, get books signed by them. I guess because we're all still fans at heart, right? I, I've done it so many times. I've got, you know, gone up to William McIlvaney to say how much I like his books. Um, Lawrence Block, Larry Block, say I'm a huge fan. Um, uh, Elroy, terrifying though it was, going up to him with a kind of cheap tatted paperback of his to get him to sign it for me. Um, and, and, you know, they were all generous. They were all, they were all generous to a fault. And this was a young writer. They didn't know me from Adam. They had no idea who I was. But they all gave me the time of day. And writers are pretty good that way, pretty great that way. And again, especially in my genre, I think. Your career has traveled some certainly unusual and outright unique paths in the course of getting to where you sit today. When you reflect back, what are some of the points of advice that you'd share with writers looking to follow in your footsteps? Well, you know, I mean, I've never, never attended a creative writing class in my life. I mean, I just read a lot of books, read a lot of books and sat in my room and wrote a lot. Um, and then learned to self-edit, learned what was good and what was bad and what was indifferent and what could be improved and how you could improve it. And that's just trial and error a lot of the time. Um, there comes that scary moment where you've got to show it to someone, a friend or a stranger, and they're going to give you some hopefully genuine feedback. And so you've got to get a pretty tough carapace. You've got to get a pretty tough skin to survive that because nobody likes it. N nobody likes being told their baby is really ugly. Okay. <laughs> nobody likes that. Um, uh, or, you know, yeah, your, your kid's actually a good looking kid, but why has it got those weird hands? Um, you know, so we don't, you've got to learn to deal with that and you've got to get lucky. I mean, you've got to be persistent. And you've got to get lucky. You've got to be writing something that somebody's looking for, really. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of rejection letters in my life, short stories, dozens and dozens of rejection letters. Um, uh, but, you know, I just didn't want to give in. I was, there's a Scots word, T-H-R-A-W-N, thrown, which just means stubborn, hard-headed, not going to give in. And... Um, it was the one thing I wanted to do. The one thing I wanted to do was be a writer. So, you know, even if nobody had wanted my books, I was going to keep writing because specifically I was writing stories for myself. I was writing stories that I hadn't read, stories that I would like to read, stories that hadn't been written yet. And, you know, if you're going to be a writer, you will, be a, you will become a writer. Nothing will stop you from doing it. But there has to be a little bit of magic dust and there has to be a little bit of luck. From honorary doctorates to being elected a fellow in the Royal Society of Literature, what have you most enjoyed about seeing Rebus in your own name as an author become so influential in pop culture throughout the years? Oh, it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's got to be the fans. It's got to be the fact that Rebus has become real to so many people. There's a Rebus walking tour in Edinburgh. You can go and look at Arden Street where he lives. You can go to the Oxford Bar and have a pint and sit at the table where he sits. You can go and walk past the police stations he works in and see where some of the crimes have taken place. And he's become very real to people. They really care about him. And, and that's, that's an incredible thing because he's ink on a page. When it comes down to it, he's millions of words of dots of ink on a page. But he's become real and people treasure him. And, uh, and that, so I feel a real sense of duty and curatorship that I can't mistreat him. Because people keep saying, well, look, he's got to die eventually. And I'm going, well, I don't feel really comfortable about doing that yet. Um, uh, but, you know, age is against me and him, I guess. I just, I don't know which one of us is going gonna, is gonna to die first. Um, but we know, that we know, don't we, that good literary characters never die. 
Sherlock Holmes is still going. Miss Marple, Hercule Poirot, especially in the crime world, it seems. Um, good characters never die. So there's that to look forward to, even if I'm not around to see it. Before we go, where haven't you jetted off to yet in a book that you still want to go someday? Um, I've never been in the top 10 New York Times list. I've been in the top 15, but not the top 10. I wouldn't mind a top 10 one of these days. But no, I've, you know, I've done most of it. I've done most of it. And uh, I started young. So I'm now, you know, I'm 61 now and I'm feeling that I'm pretty much I'm pretty tired. You know, the books used to come easily. The books used to come two books a year. Boom, boom, boom. No problem. And now it's, it doesn't get easier. You know, I wish, I wish, I wish it was a bit easier. I think when I started out, I had the notion it was like being a car mechanic. Once you've stripped an engine enough times, you can do it blindfold. It's not like that with writing. It gets harder. It gets harder. And you've got all these younger writers coming up who want some of what, some of what you've got. Uh, and they're all writing really interesting stories and they've got new ways of looking at the genre. The crime novel keeps reinventing itself. The whodunit keeps reinventing itself. And that's fascinating to me as well. Um, so maybe I need to slow down a bit and do a lot more reading and read some of these great young writers. Mr. Rankin, it's been a rare privilege. I cannot thank you again for taking out time to be on About the Authors TV. No, no problem at all, man. It was nice talking to you. And that's my work done now for the day. I can go to the pub. <laughs>